I was going to preach on the doctrine of election because I think it's important for us to understand what it means to be called, whether that calling is to the Christian life or that calling is to service or whatever that calling might be. It's important to understand that, but I didn't get very far into that. Because God uh, kind of focused my attention on some words that really I think we need to focus on and think about. In uh, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 3, after Paul the Apostle introduces and greets the people, um, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. Now, that's, that's where I got when I started thinking about these words in the heavenly places or in, as some translations have, in the heavenly realm. Because that's where the spiritual blessings come from. They come from that heavenly realm. And I remembered that in, especially in this epistle, Paul uses that phrase a number of times. So I started to think about heavenly places. You know, um, a lot of times we think of heaven only when we're confronted with uh, some, the loss of someone. Or we only think of heavenly places when we are in a real bind in this world and we want to get out of it. And the easiest way we can think of to get out of it is for God just to take us out. And, and uh, we know heaven has to be better than this. But I really think that we ought to really focus on heaven and, and what we are talking about here, these heavenly places, more often than we do. And so, I want to throw some things out at you. First of all, I want to say that I believe we have to treat this unseen world. And that's what it is. You know, um, Unfortunately, we spend a lot of time focusing on what we can see. We look in the mirror and, and get ready for work. We're focusing on what we can see. Um, I don't know where Ted went. That's okay. But Ted was talking about the fellow that with the grumpy attitude. You know, a, a part of your preparation for the day ought to be get away from the mirror and get your attitude straight. I'm serious. You ought, to, you, ought, you ought to focus on your attitude because that's really a more important part of your work and your day than how you look. I'd much rather be around a disheveled, uh, happy, encouraging, enthusiastic person than I had a formal... A uh, nicely dressed person with a bad attitude. <laughs> well, I understand that. I understand that your attitude is affected by how you look. Um, and I'm not encouraging you to go around looking like you're a bum. Uh, but, but don't forget to focus on attitude. Okay? We spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, where we're going to go, you know, what, how we're going to entertain ourselves. And we spend very little time thinking about a very real part of our world and our lives that we call the spiritual realm. And I think we ought to spend more time thinking on that. And that's why I say we must treat this unseen world as a real part of our lives. If you turn to Colossians chapter 4, or chapter 3 actually, you could turn to chapter 4, but then you'd have to turn back to chapter 3 because that's where I'm going to be. <coughs> Paul says there to the Colossians, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. He could have just as easily said, seek those things in the heavenly realm or in the heavenly places. 
But he says here, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There are some things that he tells us here. We ought to first of all focus on the spiritual realm. He says, seek those things which are above. Are you striving to put heavenly priorities into daily practice in your life? Are you striving to let the spiritual realm invade your physical realm so that it becomes a very vital and important part of your life? It is, by the way, a very real and important part. Uh, they talk about the fifth dimension as being uh, where you begin to talk about possible worlds, but the Bible talks about the fifth dimension, the spiritual dimension, as a very real dimension. It's not a possible world, it is a world. It is a world that's all around us, and we can't see it, but it's there. So we need to have the right focus in our lives. We need to focus on the spiritual realm, and how that directs us and guides us in our physical lives. The second thing is the right affection. And here it says, set your mind, verse 2, on things above. But the King James says, set your affection on things above. And the word mind there is a little bit, it, it gives you the impression anyway that this is more of a mental exercise, but that's not really what it's about. It's, it's a volitional thing. It's where we, we want to be involved in this area of life. Set your affection on things above. What do you desire? Do you want the spiritual to be a part of your life? And then the right security. I like what uh, Tammy read. Because really this is what uh, this verse is talking about. For you died. Your old life is gone. If you're a Christian, you don't have a, an old life. You're a new person. And it says here, your life is hidden with Christ in God. I love that. There's, a, there's a, the right security. You know, if, if something is hidden away, uh, Jesus put it this way, lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. In heaven. Where moth and rust don't corrupt and where thieves don't break through and steal. If your life is hidden in Christ, it cannot be touched. It is secure. Your spiritual life, which should be the source of your life, is secure in Christ. Nobody can touch that. Nobody can take that away. You are hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ appears... The, the spiritual life that you now possess will become a very real and evident thing because when He appears, we're going to appear with Him in glory. So we need to stop avoiding the spiritual realm. We need to start thinking about it. We need to start understanding it. We need to start welcoming that part of our lives into the arena of life. And the second thing is we must keep this world from imposing its values on us. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Beginning with verse, looks like verse 15. John, the beloved apostle, says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. 
There are some things that I, I see in this passage that we as Christians have. We have a different affection. The world and the love of the world crowds out a love for God. You can't have both. You can't be focused on the world and focused on God at the same time. Uh, there's a little statement there I threw in. I think it's on your notes. To be consumed with this life is to be unprepared for the next. If you're so consumed with this life that you're not thinking about heavenly realities, then you're not going to be prepared for the next life. You're not going to be prepared for those spiritual realities. We have a different affection. You can love the world or you can love the, the, uh, the Lord. You can't love both. We have a different source. It says here that the world is composed of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that's not from the Father. So the world in essence stands in opposition to all that we hold dear. Its values and our values are totally different. And you can let those values invade your life and become a part of your life. Or you can do what you should do and reject them and live by the values of eternal life. Let God's values be your values. And there's a different result. Notice, if you want to cling on to this world, if you want to hold on to this world, fine. Uh, it, well, it's not fine, but it's what is. But here's the thing. The world is what? It's passing away. It's fleeting. It's not going to be around forever. You can cling to these things if you want to, but they won't be here forever. And when they're gone, what will be left? Huh? When, when this life is gone, what's going to be left? The world is passing away, but the one who does the will of the Father abides forever. That's what counts. Now you can focus on the physical life. It's going to go. But if you focus on the spiritual life, that's going to be around forever. Number three, we must represent this unseen world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul talks about the future. And in the later epistles, he, he really thinks a lot about it because he's getting closer to the end. In this passage, he talks about putting off this earthly body. He likens the earthly body to a tent. Uh, and uh, we're not looking for this building to last forever. We're looking for an eternal building. We're looking to be with the Lord. But then at the end of the chapter, he talks about what, what it means to live with this focus on the future that God has an eternal place for us. And by the way, we are already members of that eternal kingdom. We just haven't realized all the blessings that that eternal kingdom will bring to us someday, but we are in that kingdom right now. And he says in verse 20, when I was growing up, uh, the Assembly of God Church that I was a part of, they had a program for young people called Ambassadors for Christ. I think I still have one of the t-shirts over there. I, <clears throat> I kept it even though I can't wear it anymore for some reason. But, but anyway, um, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We are ambassadors for Christ. I thought that was intriguing. And I started doing a little research on the internet about what an ambassador does. And essentially, an ambassador in another country, we send ambassadors all over the world, by the way, to various countries where they will allow us to send one anyway where we have diplomatic relations, we'll send an ambassador. Now we even have an special ambassadors, ambassadors to NATO, to the United Nations, 
etc. The reason we send them is not because we want them to become members of another country. An ambassador who becomes a member of another country essentially commits treason, right? Because they're not going there to become a part of that country. They are going there to represent, to protect, and to promote the interests of the United States of America. Now we are ambassadors for Christ, so what should we be doing in this world? We should be promoting and protecting the interests of our king, of the realm which is the source of our lives. We ought to be promoting him, Christ. We are his ambassadors. He has sent us into this world to promote his kingdom. Uh, I like what Tony said this morning, and I believe it. You know, I'm not, as a pastor, God did not call me to be a judge of another person. He did call me to be a fruit inspector <laughs> to see if there's some something there in a person's life that's not supposed to be, and if I have an opportunity, I'll call you out on it. You know that, right? I'm not going to do it in anger. See, because it's not my it's not my job to judge. It's my job to inform, to, to remind you where you are. And if you're not where you need to be, I need to tell you. But I'm not going to stop loving you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm not going to cast you aside just because I don't agree that you are where you need to be spiritually. God's already built in a couple of things for that. He's built in, for instance, consequences. And uh, those consequences, they come. When we don't do it God's way, guess what? There are consequences to pay for that. But me ragging you is not one of the consequences. I'm going to stand for the truth and I'm going to point out God's way. And I'm going to challenge you to live that way. The church should only turn their back on someone who refuses to repent. And we only turn our backs on someone then in the hope that they will understand what they've done and find forgiveness and seek forgiveness. But when a person has sought God's forgiveness and God has forgiven them, we, we do what? We embrace them. We embrace them in God's love. Like the prodigal son, when he came back, did the father snub his nose? Say, where have you been? I don't, I don't agree with where you've been. I don't like what you did, so I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Is that what he did? No. Even before the son got there, he ran out. Threw his arms around that son and welcomed him home. That's the response of a repentant, of a, a father to a repentant son. And the response of a church to a repentant soul is to run and embrace our arms around that person and enfold them in love and say, we, we're so grateful you've seen the light that God's forgiven you and you are walking in His ways. That's what we do. Now, we are ambassadors for Christ which means that we've got to know what Christ wants from us. We've got to know how we need to live in order to represent Him. But that's a huge responsibility. Ambassadors have the responsibility of representing their homeland. We're not here. This isn't our home. We, our home is somewhere else now. And we're representing that home here. Ambassadors plead the cause of their homeland. And notice here it says, as ambassadors, what are we doing? We're pleading with people. We're imploring them. Why? Because we're not members of this world. We're members of another world and we are imploring them to come and be reconciled to God. That's our desire, for them to become citizens of our homeland. Ambassadors seek to reconcile others. 
And that's what this passage is talking about. We need to be ambassadors in this world. Pleading, imploring, challenging people to come. Come to the Savior. Become members of the eternal band. The eternal bond of brothers. And fourthly, we need to remember that this heavenly realm this unseen world is the source of our lives. And I want you to go back to Ephesians for just a minute. I'm almost finished. In chapter 1 and verse 3, as I read before, every spiritual blessing that God has given us flows from where? From the heavenly realm. From those heavenly places. You want real blessing? By the way, Thank you for the, 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 I haven't looked at it yet, but thank you for the card and for whatever else that you gave me to remind me that you appreciate me as a pastor. That's wonderful. I, I enjoy that and I thank you for that. But the greatest source of blessings that I have is not in this life. The greatest source of blessings come from God. And those are blessings that the world can't take away, by the way. Another place, though, I want you to turn is uh, to chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, I'm going to start reading with verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places, or in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> we have a special position. Our true lives are grounded not here on this earth, but we are grounded in that heavenly place. We, first of all, were made alive. Down here we were dead, but from heaven life has come. We've been made alive. We've been raised up. <laughs> raised up. We, weak, anemic, susceptible to death, Christians have been not only made alive, but we've been raised up to live forever with Him. Spiritually, now we've been raised. And now we are sitting together in heavenly places with Christ. That's our exalted position as Christians. Seated together with Him. The rights, the blessings, the privileges of Christ belong to us as well because of what He's done for us. And we are sharing in His victory. I, um, I think it was last Sunday, um, we talked about the um, faith that moves mountains. And of course, anytime you talk about that verse, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, and you say to this mountain, be moved and cast into the ocean, it will be done. That's what we say. Because that's what Jesus told us. But what we really think is, yeah, really? And I used an illustration that I'm going to repeat here. Um, an illustration from um, Episode 5 of Star Wars. The Empire Strikes Back. Some of you won't know what I'm talking about, but just listen. You may catch a glimpse of it. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? Luke Skywalker has gone to the Dagobah system to find uh, this uh, Yoda, who is a great Jedi warrior, he has heard, but he's never met. And when he sees him, a little green man shows up with, I mean, shriveled up. You, you can't expect this to be a warrior, right? So um, when Luke lands, he lands in this swamp and 
his ship proceeds to sink into the swamp to where it's no longer visible. And so uh, he's going through his training with Yoda and they get to this point where Yoda tells him to raise his ship out of the swamp. And of course, uh, Luke starts trying to raise the ship and it's starting to come out of the swamp and all of a sudden he just and it sinks back down into the swamp. And Yoda has this disappointed look. And then uh, Yoda proceeds to raise the ship out of the swamp and bring it up over and land it on the ground. And Luke says, I don't believe it. And Yoda says, that is why you fail. Christians, you could learn something from that. You know why you fail? Because you don't believe it's possible to succeed. You don't believe it. And because you don't believe it, whether it's moving a mountain, and by the way, we, we did talk about this, there aren't just physical mountains. Usually there's not a physical mountain that needs to be moved around here because we've either tunneled through it or made a road around it, so there's really no reason to mess with mountains here. Besides, most people say I'm, they're not mountains anyway, they're just hills. Okay, but I came from Arkansas down in the flatlands where, you know, hills were just rolling along. But here you have mountains, okay? However, there are mountains in your life. Spiritual mountains. There are emotional mountains. There are difficulties and problems and challenges that you don't think you can face. And the reason you fail is because you don't trust Him to help you move. It's just that simple. Listen, go back to chapter 1. Verse 19. Paul is praying uh, and he wants them to know what the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe is according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the what? Heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this age but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ has been raised from the dead and seated in the heavenly realm. And the power that he has, the power that raised him from the dead, is the power that is available to you and me as we live our daily lives. But you have to believe that that power is yours. The power to us who believe. Do you believe it? If not, that's why you fail. Turn to uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Here's an interesting thought. Why is, you, you think, why is my life so important? Who cares uh, by the little things in my life and what's going on in my life. Well, listen to this. I'm going to begin reading, I guess... Whew. The Apostle Paul strings such long sentences together. Anyway, let's, let's read from verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, that this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that in other words the reason that this grace is working the reason that God has given him this ministry to unfold this mystery about God's grace is this, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church 
to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. In other words, in fact, Peter says it this way, that angels desire to look into God's redemptive plan. Angels are interested in what's going on here and what God's doing here in our lives. And you may not think it's a big deal, but, but you are teaching and God is teaching through you lessons that even angels need to learn. That's something. So don't think it's not a big deal. Your life is a big deal to God. And then finally, chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Here's another reason you need to think about the heavenly realm. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where? In heavenly places. Notice what it says, first of all. These, this, this wickedness, these, these sources of evil come from where? Heavenly places. But who's struggling? Who's wrestling? We are. So, if you don't think about this, the, the spiritual realm, you're still going to have to deal with it because the, the, the real struggle you're going to have in life is not going to be with people. Oh yeah, you're going to struggle with people. But some of those people are going to be influenced by that spiritual realm we're talking about. Right? The real, the real struggle, the real battle is going to come in that spiritual realm from those sources Paul talks about. And whether you realize it or not, a lot of times your struggle, you think you're struggling with work, you think you're struggling with your family, you think you're struggling with friends, you think you're struggling with church members, you think you're struggling with uh, fellow workers, when the real battle is taking place on a very different level and you just don't realize it, you just think you're fighting people, but you're not. You're fighting spiritual sources of evil at work. And if you don't realize it, you're not going to be able to fight well. It's like putting on a blindfold um, and uh, fighting Lee Woodward. He might not be so, well, he is kind of tough, but he might not be so tough if I don't have a blindfold, but if I put on a blindfold, I'm never going to know where the punch is coming from. And if you fight in the spiritual realm this way, if you allow the spiritual realm to fight you this way with blinders on, you're never going to know where the punch is coming from. And you'll lose. So what am I saying? You have a spiritual life. It's an important part of your life and you better pay attention to it. Let's pray.